If you clicked on this video expecting a standard, regular review of Celeste, then this is not the right video for you. This video is about me and my relationship with the game. It will... it's a very lightly scripted. It's gonna have very little editing done to it, much like my one-take series, except maybe even less so. This is not a review of the game Celeste, although I will be covering all the aspects of the gameplay and the story and all that and that I think are worth covering. It will cover, be covering a lot of the same things as a review, but I wouldn't consider this a review as that is not the focus. Celeste is my favorite game of all time, without a doubt. I am extremely devoted to that opinion. I have a Celeste shirt, I have a Celeste mug, I have a Celeste sticker on my phone, my entire right monitor, the only icon on it is a link to the Celeste soundtrack. This piece of media, the Celeste is my favorite piece of media all of all time, just in general, it doesn't have to be game. Celeste tops everything else, and in this video I guess, is here to explain that. I am guess I'm just sick of people questioning why I rank it above literally everything else. I am often pretentious with this opinion of it being better than everything else, not just subjectively, but objectively the best, and I really don't care what others say. So hopefully this video should sh shed some light on that. If you haven't played Celeste for yourself, I highly suggest you do so before you watch this video. I will be con covering the gameplay first before touching on any story, story aspects, however I will be covering the story in its entirety in great depth later on in the video and I will let you know when that happens. On top of that, this I'm going to give a trigger warning for anything involving poor mental health, including but not limited to self-harm, depression, anxiety, anything like that. Really, anything in that kind of realm. That will be covered, although somewhat lightly, for some of the heavier triggers. So. Let's start with the gameplay. The simple core mechanic of a dash is extremely understandable. You can dash in a straight line in eight di different directions at any time. You get one dash before you have to touch the ground again. One dash in the air before you have to touch the ground again and then you get another dash. This extremely simple concept goes so, so deep. Because it's not just a simple dash forward. It's not a burst of speed, it's an entire burst of momentum. This dash, the fact that you can do it in air, turns it from a simple 2D platformer into, well, it honestly just gives it an entirely new dimension. Aerial mobility is way more emphasized than any other platformer I've played. You will go... <laughs> you will go a long time before touching the ground. You will touch the ground way less often. There's way less ground to stand on in general compared to every other platformer I've played. Every single aspect, every single item on screen is used in some way. There is no loose ends. There's no unexplored mechanics, everything is used. Every little quirk of the engine itself, every way that the momentum of the dash interacts with everything else, that is considered. Every, things you would cons you'd think are just speedrun techs are actually full-on intended mechanics that are introduced way later in the game. It's a, honestly a speedrunner haven. The amount of improvement and speed and... you. There's just so much 
you can just constantly improve yourself and go faster and faster and faster as you keep playing the game. Although nothing is ever forced in terms of speed, you are never required to go a certain pace. Other than, of course, when the challenge calls for it. That's not. That sounds wrong. What I meant to say is there's no timers on anything. You could take your time for pretty much anything. The challenge in the difficulty curve of the game is the best I have ever seen. You are challenged from within five minutes of starting the game. You will be challenged already. And that level of challenge stays consistent throughout the entire game. Whether you are doing end game content, uh, just cleaning up, going for 110%, true 100% or whatever, or just completing the main story, you will always feel challenged. But you are never, ever told to do something that you're not capable of. Everything is fair. You are capable of doing everything. You are always challenged. You are never under-challenged. You are never over-challenged. It is always perfect from the moment you start the game until the moment you put it down for the final time. There is always a perfect amount of challenge. And I am not exaggerating when I say this. You are always engaged and improving and challenged. I don't know how else to put it. The accessibility is very well done in the game as well. There's an assist mode, uh, there's plenty of checkpoints. You could leave in the middle of a level wherever you want, and you could just jump back in at any point. It also always... the game... <sighs> Sorry, back to accessibility. Every single cutscene is skippable. Every single time where you are not physically moving the character, Madeline, can be skipped. Oh, uh, sorry, let me backtrack a little bit to the speedrunning thing. Every time you die, it is like, I didn't time it myself, but probably about half a second death animation, not even that. And even that can be sped up. Every single aspect of quote unquote waiting can be sped up. You die and you are back in the action within like 10 frames, 15 frames, maybe not that little, but it is incredible how little uh, waiting there is in this game. There is actually next to none. You are always in the thick of it. The game also just always consistently keeps giving you more. It took me about seven hours to complete the main story for the first time. I am now about 60 hours into my main save file, and I wouldn't even consider myself close to 100%. And it, it, it's all been new content, there's no filler. It just keeps giving and giving and giving. Every time you think you're done, there's just more to do in the best way possible. It, you know, you could get so much out of this game. $20, and you could easily get probably a good 100, 200 hours if you want to go for true 100%. Even more, depends on your skill level. And it just gives and gives and gives and does not let up. I see the biggest reason why I see people not get into the game or not buy it or not try it is because they're intimidated. They think they're not good enough. I am inclined to disagree. This game can be beaten by anyone. Yes, it is incredibly challenging, but it's nothing anyone can't do. It is the easiest hard game I have ever played. I will not say this game is easy, it will absolutely challenge you, no matter what. But people see you doing endgame shit and ex assume that they have to be able to keep up with that. But everyone starts with their first steps. A lot of the time they don't see the first few moments of the game that everybody has to go through. It's constantly accelerating the challenge, so if you take a look at the game, 
partway in, you're already, it already seems way ahead of what your skill level would be. Don't be intimidated by not being good enough at platformers, because really, I truly mean this when I say this, I feel like anyone can be able to play this game as long as you could hold a controller and press buttons. And even then, there is assist mode. And honestly, the story's worth it, even with assist mode. It's also smart with how it handles its non-linear progression. This, the game is split into nine main chapters. The first seven chapters are your main story. After you finish your seventh chapter, the game becomes non-linear. You go for collectibles scattered throughout the nine, or sorry, the eighth chapters. And it <laughs> lets you know that very well. At the beginning, at the very beginning of chapter eight, after you finish the story, you will encounter a door that cannot be opened until you have a certain amount of a collectible that certainly no one without prior notice, without knowing about it beforehand, would ever have... <laughs> no one would ever reach the threshold if they didn't already know about the door and where to get those collectibles, because these collectibles are hidden deep, deep within each level. So that door right there just pretty much tells you after the seventh chapter, the progression is all entirely non-linear and up to you as the player. How is it how does the difficulty stay consistent even with the non-linear progression? Well, it's just everything past that point is at a similar skill level, you know? And you don't unlock the next set of harder challenges until you have everything done for your one set. I don't know how else to describe it, but the the difficulty curve is still there, even if it's up to the player as to what you're doing next. Back to what I was saying about constant acceleration of challenge. You don't even realize the insane shit you're doing, the insane shit that you're pulling off until you go back and try the same level again, and all of a sudden, oh, this level that took me 40 minutes before is taking me 8 minutes. This level that took me a thousand deaths before took me 50. It's <laughs> insane. It's, it's, like a, it's like that old euphemism about boiling a frog. You don't even know how good you're getting. And, well, I guess the boiled frog is a little bit more morbid. You don't, the, do, the frog doesn't know it's being boiled alive until it's too late. I felt like that with Celeste. I didn't realize that I was playing so intensely that I was literally giving myself carpal tunnel until I was like halfway through the main content. Past the main story, of course. If you do have Carpal Tunnel, don't worry about it. The main story will not be enough to trigger that for most people. The game wants you to succeed. It advertises itself. Not necessarily talking about just, like, just actual advertisements, but like how it presents itself. It wants you to succeed. Yes, it's challenging as all hell, but it's not like Dark Souls where it is like in your face about, oh, you're gonna die because you suck. It's more like, yes, this game is hard, but it's nothing that you can't handle. It tells you right from the very beginning, you can do this. You are always capable. You always have all the information you need. There is nothing that's not fair. And the encouragement is just constant. There's little postcards at the start of every chapter, just giving you a little, go get them. Encouraging you to push forward, even if you've died a thousand times, which seems like a lot. You're getting better with every death. You can do this. No matter what anyone says, you are capable. You can do this. Now, artistically speaking, you can probably just tell this by looking at the footage, but the pixel art is absolutely stellar. The f 
freaking color usage is beautiful. The foreground and background are entirely distinct. The information is never confusing. And the music is a perfect catalyst for the emotions that the story brings. The story. Once again, if you haven't played the game yourself, I super, super highly encourage you to just play the game first. Then you can come back and watch the rest of this video. I've already given you plenty of reason to rank it amongst one of the best games of all time, just mechanically ignoring the story. So please, go give it a shot. It's worth it, trust me. It's worth your time, worth your money. <sighs> Celeste is a game about climbing a mountain. And really, it's hard to say much more than that. You play as Madeline, or however you name her. I may switch back and forth between saying Madeline and Madeline. Either way, you are Madeline, and you are on a journey to climb Mount Celeste. And that's pretty much what you do. You climb the mountain. You meet a couple people, you fall, you stumble, but you climb back up, and eventually you reach the summit. So let's, let's uh, not gloss over the important details now. You start climbing this mountain, and you realize this mountain is not a normal mountain. It has magical properties that brings out things within you. Madeline has a part of herself reveal, reveal to her. This part of herself is representative of her depression and anxiety disorder. And she learns how to deal with it over the course of the journey. It's simple at a glance. A lot of people who play it don't, they don't understand how this story can be so impactful, and that's okay. It, the story is made for a very specific audience. I am a part of that specific audience. The, it is simple at a glance, and if you don't relate to Madeline, then yeah. The this, this story probably isn't anything special, but it really is very deep and very, very intentional with things that extend into the gameplay itself, which you wouldn't even be able to pick up on a lot of the time. Let's just go chapter to chapter, start at the beginning. The very opening of the game has four words coming from Madeline herself. Just those four lines set up a lot. Just those four lines establish an anxiety disorder. It's instantly recognizable for anyone who struggles with it or have seen others struggle with it. And there's self-doubt and determination and it's all contradicting itself and it's just four lines. You go a little bit further, you realize that this path is dangerous. Granny, the grandma, we call her Granny, the old lady, she has some very vague and almost lunatic sounding advice that doesn't make entire sense to Madeline. But this is actually more of a warning directed at the player, which won't really make sense until you've already seen too much. The player, the first time through, and Madeline both brush it off. And then it tells you, 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 you have a big fumble right at the beginning, almost fall to your death, and then you realize you have the ability to dash. This mountain has brought that ability out from within you. And it tells you right off the bat, you can do this.
chapter one doesn't do too much. It introduces Theo, who is super kind and representative of what the player's friends who support them in their real life through their troubles. Theo is, Theo is always there for you, always supportive, always friendly and kind. And that is very important. He is someone that you can trust at all times. So even if you technically just met the guy, you know instinctively that this guy is your friend. And through the gameplay, by the end of chapter one, the player understands that this game does not gonna hold back. It's throwing challenges you challenges at you from the very fucking beginning, from the first level, you are being pushed to your limit. That limit isn't very high yet. It doesn't push you so hard that you break and you want to give up, but it does push you enough where you're gonna tell yourself, okay, I have to take this game seriously. And this is all reinforced by the monument dedicated to those who perished during the climb. This is not a journey that many have the strength to take, but that again, most people don't need to take this journey. It's for the very specific people who need to take this journey, such as Madeline. Chapter two introduces the part of Madeline. She tells you you're not a mountain climber. She tells you to stop what you're doing. She tells you to just give up where you are. You'll never make this. This is dangerous and stupid. Madeline tries to bargain with this part of herself. She feels <laughs> stupid. She feels kind of crazy. The, this one part of herself seems so cold and logical and really hard to argue against. And <sighs> it doesn't accept no as an, for an answer. It's relentless and constantly trying to hinder you constantly trying to hold you back, stop you from doing this. And in all honesty, it's very easy to hate this part of Madeline. And then you get to this phone call, and the phone call shows how you can hate and blame yourself for the way things are, for the way you act, for the conditions you have, that can all be internalized, hate, like, uh, hate directed towards yourself, which is often common. It's often the case for people with anxiety and depression and such is they blame themselves for the way they are. It prevents you from helping yourself because you think that you're faking it or that you're not deserving of it or that you're actually a bad person. And it can really prevent you from getting the help you need and shutting off people who try to help you or shutting out people who try to help you. Theo cuts in through the melancholy and fills the scene with warmth and honestly just lightens the mood a whole lot, but this only lasts for as long as you are with him. As soon as you leave his side, everything gets all cold again. The second phone call shows you that the people who are trying to help you are really trying to help you, and they're not... They don't hate you. Like, that part of yourself hates you. And they don't hate you like that part of yourself wants you to think they hate you. Chapter 3. A lot of newer players will struggle with this chapter or hate it or be very annoyed by it. These balls of anxiety aren't controlled by the player like previous obstacles were. They're all independent from the player's actions. It's frustrating your first time too, through. It's not easy to work around. And all this is intentional. Oshiro, just like Madeline, has the same issues, anxiety, specifically. He's obviously not trying to hurt you, so you don't hate him like you hate that anxious part of Madeline. You may sympathize him, you want to help him, but he's still hurting you. Oshiro is representative of toxic relationships that almost everyone finds themselves in. Your first few times through Chapter 3, it's hard, everything is out of your control, but there are clear patterns. 
you can learn to deal with it. Just like real talks like toxic relationships in real life, there are patterns, and you learn how to deal with it, and most importantly, you can't stay. You have to leave for the sake of yourself. You can't keep trying. You can keep trying and trying to help, hoping that they'll get better, and maybe it does help them a little bit. But at the end of the day, they can only get better if they want to help themselves. They, you can help them along the right path. But at the end of the day, they're not going to make these major leaps until they take these major leaps themselves. And it's okay if you want to help, but you can't stay if it's hurting you, even if they don't mean to hurt you. You have to look out for yourself first. You can see immediately after finishing cleaning, he's ready to move on without even a thank you while Madeline is still hanging on to it. Like, what the fuck, dude? I just did all this work for you and you're already brushing it off like it is nothing. It's very clearly a toxic relationship. But as much as Oshiro is toxic towards Madeline, Madeline is also toxic towards Oshiro towards the end. It works both ways. Oshiro is hurt by the part of you, just as his issues hurt you. Oshiro is hurt just as much as Oshiro hurt you. And by you, I mean Madeline, of course, you being the player and the player being Madeline. At this point, we see Madeline truly despising that part of herself, starting to really resent this part of herself because, well, that part of herself is hurting the people around her when she really just wants to help. And that part of herself spins it back on her saying, well, you don't actually want to help these people. You're just doing it to fuel your own ego. This is these helpful acts are actually selfish. They aren't, by the way, but these this part of Madeline tells her that, and she probably believes it. At least to a certain degree. And at the very end, Oshiro ends up recognizing his mistakes and starts to correct them. He never wanted to hurt Madeline, just like how Madeline never meant to hurt him. But it wasn't anything that Madeline did or said that made him want to change. Oshiro realized that he had taken things too far. At the beginning of chapter 4, Granny reinforces the lessons that were just learned in chapter 3. Chapter 4 has very little story other than that. It's pretty, it's pretty much just a straight fight forward. We can interpret this as just like everyday life. Not every day in life is eventful. Sometimes you just live. Sometimes you just push forward. Some days are easier than others. Sometimes it feels like even if the day was uneventful, it is incredibly difficult and you're still making barely any progress. And sometimes it feels like you have to fight with everything you've got just to stand still and not fall behind. And you can feel like an unseen force is trying to directly hinder you in these moments. Just making progress is a challenge. Like, any movement forward is an immense amount of effort. Even if it feels like almost no change is being made, and the effort put in isn't equal to the amount of progress that was made, just surviving is still worth celebrating. Every step forward is meaningful and worth celebrating, and of course, this is... This is just all my interpretation of chapter 4. As is this whole video, the entire section of me interpreting this story. This is just my interpretation, but whatever. At the end of the day, it could just be that chapter 4 is just meant to be a pace breaker between the themes that were established in chapter 2 and 3 and the shitstorm of emotions that's about to come. At the end of chapter 4, Madeline has an anxiety attack. She's in a literal life-or-death situation, and the tension is high. She's completely shut down, and all she can think of is death and despair. Her emotions become uncontrollable. And uncontrollable. She lashes out at Theo. She tries to downplay how much pain she's in. She can't breathe, and it feels like she's on the verge of death. 
And if you've never had an anxiety attack before, this is how it feels almost every single time. Except anxiety attacks in real life aren't usual in, usually in actual life or death situations. But that doesn't change the fact that it feels like it's life or death. It can be something entirely mundane that triggers it. It doesn't even have to have a specific trigger. It can just happen. And even if you're entirely safe, it feels like you're about to fucking die. Like the world is collapsing around you and you just can't fucking breathe. You cannot get oxygen into your lungs. <sighs> it's like you're drowning on dry land. Your heart is trying to jump through your throat. Your entire body is in flight or fight, but you are literally paralyzed. You cannot move. You are stuck. You are dying. You are in trouble. Something wants to hurt you. <sighs> Luckily, Madeline has Theo to help her here. Having someone else around you, that you trust can drastically improve the length or intensity of anxiety attacks. It doesn't necessarily nullify it completely, but it can help quite a bit. Chapter 5 Madeline and Theo find themselves inside a temple where, in all honesty, all hell breaks loose. The dialogue between Madeline and the part of her is stuff that those suffering from anxiety and depression will be very familiar with. And these back and forth arguments, and this contradictory logic, this all happens with most people who have anxiety or depression or other mental illnesses. I'm just using anxiety and depression because that's what this game focuses on. Except it's not some separate entity outside of yourself, it's literally yourself arguing with yourself. I guess it is technically Madeline arguing with herself there, but it's characterized as a separate piece. You attack yourself, you are both sides of an argument, you are at war with yourself. And there's violence and hate and verbal, emotional, sometimes even physical damage being done. And it's all on you. It's damn near impossible to control all of this. There are ways you can manage it better, but there seems to be no way of completely stopping it. It is complete and utter chaos in your brain where nothing wants to cooperate with each other. All it knows is hate and fear and... Yeah. With enough practice, you can herd these different parts of yourselves in the general right direction so that productive things do happen, but it's a lot of work for something that is really just an incomplete solution. Theo has his own problems going on, as do most people on Earth, but we really don't need to focus on those. You can interpret it if you want, but at the end of the day, this is a story about Madeline. You gotta take care of yourself first, just like we learned with Mr. Oshiro. Chapter 6 It may have seemed to hit the fan in the last chapter, but this is where I think the most impactful part of the game lies. It starts with a postcard that stands out compared to the gentle encouragement of the other ones. It's threatening. It's not encouraging at all, actually. It's oddly introspective compared to the rest that had come before it. Then we have a nice, prolonged talk about mental health, and I really do mean nice. And it was honestly executed extremely, extremely well. It helps those who don't understand what it's like to be anxious or depressed. 
It helps them to better understand it and also helps people who do know what it's like by putting it into words that they may not have found or words they have found or and either way it's showing them that they are understood they are properly represented here and it's okay to be like this and this is normal I feel like yeah this is a good time to mention that yes I am absolutely on Madeline's sides of things here I'm sure that this isn't a huge surprise to anyone who knows this game or even just me as a person but I am mentally ill. Every single word that comes out of Madeline's mouth here, whether it's the questions that she gives Theo or the answers in response to Theo's questions, it honestly just fucking touches my soul. These are all things that I've thought a million times before. On so many layers, I, I don't know how else to put it than I am Madeline in a way. This entire journey, in fact, the ups, the downs, the entire process, I've been through all of it. Some of what Theo says I can relate to as well, but it's nowhere close to what I feel with Madeline. Every single thing she says is... feels as if I was taken straight from my brain other than, well, not the drinking part. I was only 18 when I played this game for the first time. And while I'm not generally a fan of narcotics in general, or recreation, well, anyways, that's besides the point. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try to keep it together and power through the rest of the story stuff before we touch on personal stuff anymore. Um, I'd like to draw attention to the background music in this part specifically. The music in this entire game is absolutely stunning. Beautiful Lena Rain did an insane, insane job. But this part especially touches me in a certain way. It's every comfortable leitmotif we've heard so far. It's a song of safety, warmth, comf comfort, understanding, growth. It's the song that you want to hear. And then very, very quickly, it turns sour corrupted. All the warmth that was once there quickly fades away, leaving nothing but an eerie and hollow sound that is honestly not much pleasant to listen to. There's suddenly something very threatening surrounding you. It's fuzzy and seems to be coming from every direction and also no directions. This effect is doubled if you have headphones and if you have those I'd recommend you try it while listening to this song. The songs are moving around you. And the songs themselves are scary and loud, but when they all shift to one side, the other side is extremely eerily quiet and honestly just as threatening as the cacophony on the other side. Something's here to hurt you, and you don't know where it is or what it is or when it's coming, but it is approaching fast, and all you know is that it will hurt you. It's honestly a perfect encapsulation of what anxiety feels like, at least in my opinion. And then something snaps inside of you, and you plummet, and you lose all of your progress, and you start to drown. This is followed by a long sequence of quiet reflection with no interruptions in terms of story or dialogue or really any drastic cosmetic changes. It's just you and the game reflecting on what just happened. Granny comes back and shows Madeline that she has known what she's talking about this entire time. She has always known, but the first time through, you don't really know that she knows. On repeated playthroughs, it's actually kind of scary just how much Granny actually knows about how things are and about to go down for Madeline. And for those who relate to Madeline, it's like she's speaking directly to the player. She sounds rude at the first time through, but the second time, or at least once you reach this point, she's actually kind of one of the biggest comforts. 
She tells you that it's okay to give up. It's okay if you're not ready for this. You can always come back and try again later. But Madeline, as well as the player, pushes forward. The scene is also pretty impactful if you're a spiteful person, such as myself. The line, you're not a mountain climber from chapter 2 is also repeated in this chapter, and it is honestly one of the biggest fuels into the fire. I give myself pep talks, as does Madeline, throughout this. I give myself pep talks in real life, and the phrase, you are not a mountain climber, comes up a lot, and it kicks me in the ass in the best way, like kicks me into motion. We can, we can get, a, we can touch on that later, though. All right, let's get back into the story. In the next cutscene, while this theme is underlying the whole time, it really shows that the hatred and the fear that the normal version Madeline or the player feels for this part of her goes both ways. The part of Madeline also hates, resents, fears, is annoyed by the quote-unquote normal version of Madeline because, well, there wouldn't be a war inside Madeline's head if the hatred only went one way. And, well, they're the same person. Of course they have mutual feelings. They're the same person. Maybe this is a little obvious, though. As you continue pushing towards this part of yourself, you keep digging yourself deeper and deeper into this pit. You feel like you're making negative progress, that you're further behind than you were when you started this whole shit. This entire journey, you're making negative progress. But you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, and with every major breakthrough I've had in my life, I've hit rock bottom directly beforehand. With this game specifically, I completed it in two sessions, and after my first session, I had the worst mental breakdown I've had in my entire life. We'll get into the details later, but progressing through that breakdown and reaching the origin point, digesting exactly what was going on in my head, it really felt like I was just digging myself deeper and deeper into a hole, just like Madeline does here. We have finally come to the final confrontation between Madeline and this part of herself. The fanbase have coined this part of herself as Badeline, Badeline, however you want to pronounce it, but you may have noticed that I have never said it during this video. It's a very popular term, but the game itself never calls her Badeline either. Because she's not bad, she's not evil, she's a part of you. She's a piece that contributes to the whole. Madeline's not a bad person. Madeline's, in fact, a very good person. And, quote-unquote, Madeline is Madeline. There's no part of Madeline that is evil. There are parts of her that lash out and sometimes do bad things. But that doesn't make her a bad person. She does not wish harm upon others. She's a part of you. She's a piece of the whole. And you can't ever leave her behind whether you want to or not. And if you spend your whole life trying to fight against her, you're never going to make any progress on yourself. You have to listen to this part of yourself. You have to come to understand it. Learn what makes it tick. Work with it. Accept it. Because it's not just an it, it's you. You have to work with yourself, you have to understand yourself, you have to learn how to make yourself better, how to make yourself work better, learn how to grow, learn how to flourish and blossom into the best version of yourself. And that girl in the mirror, she's you, and there's nothing in this world that can change that. And that girl in the mirror is beautiful and capable of so much. You just have to learn to work with her. The rest of chapter 6 and chapter 7 are just a victory lap. There's really not much to cover in terms of story, which means that all that's left now is me. (sighs) 
Celeste showed me a side of myself that I was too scared to admit to. It showed me that my struggles were real and seen, and it showed me that not to be ashamed of who I am. It taught me how to overcome myself like no other piece of media or friend or family member ever could. The story of Celeste is just a retelling of the same struggles I've been through all my life, except Celeste showed me that there's more to the story. It shows me that it doesn't just continue forever in the cycle, it doesn't just stop when I hit the bottom. It showed me that there's hope. And it showed me how to reach that hope, it showed me how to reach the summit of this mountain that I've been struggling to climb my entire life. My whole life, everyone, everything around me just pointed to me as a failure, a disappointment, an outcast, that the way that I was was my fault, and I just had to try harder and put in more effort and conform and follow the guidelines and push through everything. My whole life, I've been called a pessimist, which I've never really felt like was true. Whenever I... Th <sighs> I've always felt like I was optimistic based off of the shit I was dealing with, but people around me disagreed. Whenever I brought up with my feelings of anxiety, depression, suicidal intentions, the answer I was given was always to change who I am, to try harder to be normal. And I'm lazy, I'm just not trying hard enough, I have to do things differently. That it's my fault. Celeste showed me that the answer isn't trying to abandon the parts of myself that I thought were causing the issues. Celeste showed me that I'm not the only one... Celeste showed me that I'm not the one who's in the wrong. Celeste showed me that all of these suspicions I had about myself were very much real, and honestly nothing to be ashamed of. It showed me that while everyone does have their own mountains, as I was taught, the mountain that I had to climb was significantly larger than most others, and on top of that, the mountain is invisible to everyone, and including me. There's been a specific detail that I've been hiding up until this point. A detail that the majority of people outside of some of my close friends and a small part of the community I've built around myself have never known. It's a detail about myself that Celeste revealed to me more than anything else. It was a detail that was buried so deep inside of me that I never even considered it until Celeste showed me that it was there. My anxiety and depression, even my neurodivergency, that's all stuff I had suspected since I was young. Celeste just confirmed what I already suspected, and showed me that I was right all along. And that I was valid. And Celeste showed me how to run with it. After I learned how to run with it, after I learned how to not hide myself, to shut down parts of myself, to accept myself for who I truly am. After I reached the summit, and that's when this detail about myself finally seemed the light of day. 18 years and one month after I was born. Just like Madeline, I fought against myself trying to reach this point. I failed, I fell, I hit rock bottom, and I climbed up again. I reached the summit where everything is colored blue, pink, and white. Just like, Madeline, just like Madeline, I have accepted who I truly am, as a transgender woman. You know, in my first YouTube video, there was a throwaway joke that I didn't really come off as a joke, where I said, Ever since I got out of my piss baby phase, seven games total have made me cry. Three of those games are Super Mario Galaxy. Well, I did cry three times playing Super Mario Galaxy, the tears that rolled... <sighs> the tears have rolled many, many more times for Celeste than just once. In fact, I credit my ability to cry at all in current times entirely to Celeste. I suppressed my emotions for so long that I had a hard time expressing them in any capacity, and I still do to some extent. 
almost every single game I play, or every, sorry, every, that's the way I meant to say. Almost every single time I play Celeste, whether I'm doing bonus content or main game or even whenever songs from the soundtrack play while I'm doing literally anything else, even while I'm at work at my actual job, I break down in tears. Sometimes it's just a couple tears rolling down my cheek, but much more often I sob or bawl. And to be honest, I'm not ashamed of it anymore. There's no more hiding, no more running away. This is the way that I am, and that's okay. It's okay to be who I am. I beat Celeste for the first time on July 3rd, 2020, one month after my 18th birthday. At this point, I had graduated, I had a full-time job, I was looking to get my driver's license and moved out of my parents' house. I have since done both of those. And I was finally able to I was finally being treated as an adult. I was out of school, I had cut off all of my toxic influences, all my f so called friends that had negatively affected me, all of these superior officers telling me how to feel or act. I had none of that anymore. Maybe Celeste simply came around at the perfect time in life. Maybe I would have made this growth without it but it certainly accelerated it. It took me a few months to fully process all of the emotions and changes that, are, that the major mental breakdown I mentioned earlier brought. Sometimes during the process, I started realizing that I wasn't happy with my gender identity. I started experimenting with pronouns and sometime in like October, I decided that I didn't want to go back to being a cisgendered male. Once the, flood, once the floodgates of me being queer opened, I made, a few real, few, I made a few realizations back to back to back. I'm asexual. I'm panromantic. I'm neurodivergent. In January, I felt comfortable and confident in saying that I am, in fact, a trans girl. Although I still think I'm somewhat non-binary, and I don't think that's going to change any much. I don't think that... It's going to change much anytime soon, at the very least. I'm pretty confident that this is who I am. And to be completely honest with you, I'm fucking sick of pretending I've, I'm something I'm not. So, Celeste is a game that changed my life. While it's okay to say it's not your favorite game or that it still has some minor flaws, I never want to hear that it's overrated or generic or not as deep as me people make it out to be again. Celeste is one of the best games ever made, to, and I seriously doubt I'll ever come across a game or piece of media I cherish more than Celeste. If you made it this far, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your acceptance. And if you don't accept me, well, that's fucking tough luck. My name is Dylan Haslam, and I am a trans girl. And there's no one that's going to fucking take that from me. While I may not be here for long, for whatever time I do have, I'm going to fight for it just like I always have. If the world wants me dead, then it'll have to kill me itself. Who chooses to stand against me or march forward alongside me won't change my path anymore. But to those who do stick by me, I will try my best to make this world a better place for all of you, one day at a time. My name is Dylan Haslam, and to those who can accept me for who I am, well, I hope to see you soon.